All right, what's going on, y'all? It's Jay Myrex, Arturus.com. Thank you once again for joining me. Um, just getting started, but I appreciate y'all joining. Um, if you haven't already done so, make sure you check out my website, www.altruist.com. I have a free six part video course entitled Sound Mind Sessions that is designed to help recording artists, producers, engineers, sound designers, anyone that's really looking to get into the game of music, music industry. This is the course for you. This is a great primer for things to think about, a lot of things to consider, a lot of things to keep in mind as you pursue your goals as a recording artist, okay? So make sure you check that out, altruist.com. It's free, go to my website. I'll leave a link in the video description. You'll, you'll get a lot of value out of, out of this video and um, this video series for that matter. Um, tonight, I'm gonna be discussing a few different things. Um, Primarily just, you know, I want to talk about music technology. I'm always interested in, you know, sharing different ideas about music technology. Um, I want to talk a bit about um, some other things that's been on my mind, like gaming culture and um, the intersection between music technology and gaming culture. And also just want to talk about um, some things just related to internet culture. Um, so that's what we're talking about tonight. Hopefully this is a discussion that piques your interest. Um, I would love to continue to have a conversation with you guys about this stuff. But yeah, as always, I like to ask, where's everybody from? Um, I see I see some people in the chat now. So let me um, welcome people that are joining the chat. Thank you. 730 Productions LLC, thank you for joining. Um, let's see here. Uh, John Randall says, Con congratulations on the song with Trey D. Um, not sure what song you're talking about with Trey D. I don't, I don't know of a song with Trey D unless um, you know something that I know. Uh, you, you know something that I don't know, I should say. Um, let me know. <laughs> I haven't heard a song with me and Trey D, but okay, thank you nonetheless. Thank you everybody that's joining. Um, you know, I, I like to ask where everybody's from. Um, if you want to leave a comment in the, um, in the chat, let me know where you're from. I love to know where people are watching, but all right. So I just want to share some things that have been on my mind, um, uh, as of late. Um, so one of the things that I've been really pondering a lot more is just, you know, what's next for music technology. You know, I I'm always thinking about that. I'm always interested in the, the next stages, the next levels where, where's, where we're going to see growth and where we're going to see actual opportunity. Um, last year, uh, I made some videos about the future of music uh, production more so. And I was talking about iOS and iPad and all that. And, you know, I had a lot of people that said, okay, you, you going too far. It's not there yet. But I, I believe wholeheartedly that it, it'll be here within the next um within the next few years. I mean, it's already here. You're already seeing a lot more people adopting it now. I think you, you're getting a lot more influencers in the space um, that are co-signing the idea of music production with an iPad. Um, I've used the past, uh, I've used iPad for the past almost two years now, um, and I've gotten some really good results. I've learned um, how to adopt that technology because I, I spent some time really just seeking out different ways to utilize it. And I believe in the technology. So I, I think it is, um, it is promising and it is very useful. Even if you don't plan on using it full time as your main production tool, I think just opening up possibilities in mobile applications, being able to leave your studio behind, you know, leave all this stuff behind that you may have accumulated and still being able to get a, a good product out. That's very important. I think iOS does that and it will do that for a lot of people that are, um, you know, just concerned with how do I maintain the quality and maintain my productivity when I'm mobile. Um, so I've enjoyed iOS. I've actually made a lot of music on iOS over the past couple years now. And, you know, I'm, I'm pretty happy with the results. So I'm going to continue to use that. It won't be the sole thing that I'm using. I'm still using um, machine. I'm still using 
MPC from time to time. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a lover of technology in general, so I'm always going to try new things. But I, I definitely believe that the iOS opens up a lot of possibilities. If you haven't already tried it, I would suggest that, you know, some of the, the better applications to um, look into would be things like BeatMaker 3. That's a great all around app that does sampling, sequencing, and um, audio recording, audio, audio tracks. It does um, pattern based and linear. It has very much the machine MPC style workflow, even, you know, some elements of Ableton push in that. Um, I think that's a great option. Um, also, another great option is Core Gadget, which is more, I would say, kind of like a workstation keyboard concept with some audio track recording, has a great sound library, great instruments, limited samplers, but if you're just more of the, I, you know, I like to load my own drums and one shots in, it's fine for that. Has limited audio track recording, it's very much loop based. Um, I would say that the sequencing is a lot more like, you know, Ableton Live or any other type of scene based sequencer. Um, but it's a good option as well. And then for DAWs, I like Cubases and I also like uh, Aurea Pro. Those are, are two um, great DAW options in the iOS domain. So if you haven't checked it out, maybe you should, you know, I would suggest starting with those things and then continue to add on to the setup as you see fit. And, you know, I think you'll find a lot of um, great opportunities and options within that world. Past that though, past iOS, I'm still thinking about what what's the next step past that? Because I think iOS is a lot closer to being a, a, a staple for a lot of people than some of us may think, but I'm thinking past that now. What's the next step? And um, a, a lot of what I've been looking into lately has been in the, the world of gaming. Because I, I believe that there's a lot of overlap in the domain of gaming as it relates to overlapping with music technology and music production technology more so. Um, I've been paying very close attention to some of the things that um, are, are going on within the gaming world. And I believe that there's a lot that us music producers can learn from looking at what's happening in the gaming world. You know, some of the things that I'm seeing is that a lot of people are spending um, their time playing games. Uh, I look at, I, I was looking at some infographics online and one of the things I noticed was that um, in this infographic, it was an infographic about the top 100 visited websites in terms of traffic on the internet. And you know, you had things like Spotify, you had things like, um, you know, SoundCloud, and there were things like that. You know, YouTube was one of the top, you know, YouTube was definitely one of the top. Of course, Facebook is, is one of the top, of course, Google. But I also saw something that was really interesting to me. I noticed that Twitch, the, um, the video, um, video sharing, you know, uh, it's it, it's a video site that is more dedicated towards the the gamer community. Even though people are using it for more than just gaming, I would say it's very highly um, motivated and influenced and catered to the the gaming community. That particular site had more traffic than Spotify and Pandora and SoundCloud, which means that a lot more people are visiting or interacting with Twitch than music streaming sites. So I, I think it's very interesting because it tells you a lot about what people are doing online. You know, what are people really doing online at the end of the day? You know, are they just looking for music all the time? Um, I don't believe that to be so, just based upon some of the, the data that I've seen around um, internet traffic. So looking at Twitch as being one of the main places that people are spending time online gives me some insight to, well, guess what? Maybe people are very interested in playing games with each other online. People are very much interested in interactions with each other online. 
um, you know, the only reason that you really are going to go to like Twitch is to look or watch somebody play a game or talk about a game that you're interested in. And I think, you know, that's a big part of the interaction that they're, they're, they're providing on a platform like Twitch. But I think what, what's interesting about Twitch is that um, people are very much engaged into the gamer's story. What, what story they're creating on screen. And I, I think that that is something that we should not overlook with respect to what keeps people interested. I think that storytelling is very interesting. It's very compelling and it will keep people engaged a lot longer than simply being focused or self-centered on, you know, what I'm doing. Cause I think, you know, with, as a human being, especially, um, some of us are able to tell better stories than others. Some of us live more interesting lives than others. You know, that's just, it is what it is at the end of the day. But I believe that people are more willing to spend their time when they can get invested in a story and follow a story. So, you know, that's one of the things that Twitch is allowing people to get into is like really get engaged with a story through a game. Um, in some cases, you know, people are watching Twitch more like, you know, a sport, you know, maybe like they're watching their favorite athlete do things within a virtual environment. Um, all of that is to say though, that I believe that there is a great opportunity for music technology to make use of these ideas that are in the gaming community and push things forward and create new ways of engaging with each other. Um, and if you guys are watching the stream right now, if, if you have any issues hearing me, please let me know. Some of y'all kind of, you know, I'm not going to call, I'm not going to bust you out, but some of y'all last stream let me stream with it clipping and I had the, the setup different. So if I'm clipping or if I sound too loud or if I sound too low, please let me know. Don't let me do the whole stream with it distorted. I, I want to make it useful for everybody. So if you have a problem with the audio right now, please let me know. But I want to continue this um, conversation because, um, you know, one of the things that I'm, I'm understanding or I, I'm thinking about now is, you know, how can music move more into the, the virtual domain? Um, I think, you know, one of the, one of the key benefits of pondering this is that in the virtual domain, we get an opportunity to start over. We get an opportunity to correct certain things that we may have done wrong, so to speak, within the, um, with, within the physical domain. Um, and l let me not be abstract about that. Let's, let's talk about this, um, more specifically. Um, one of the things that we may have done wrong in the physical domain in the, in the real world is we allowed a, devaluation of music by making a lot of music dependent on a very specific company's technology. Um, we allowed it to be very dependent on a very specific company's platform without having any real say as the music community on how that was implemented. Um, I think, you know, the transition towards being more iTunes based for some period of time. Cause I think we're past that now. I think we're, we're getting out of the iTunes era and we're moving more and more and more deeply into the era of streaming. But I think that, you know, in, in the virtual world, we'll have an opportunity to rethink how to create a value proposition for the music that is more incentivized. Um, right now, there's no real incentive for people to necessarily own music because there's, um, as a consumer, I don't necessarily care about owning the music. 
I care mostly about being able to consume the music. I care mostly about being able to listen to the music that I want to hear when I want to hear it. Whether I own that or whether I'm borrowing that from some online digital streaming platform, there's no more incentive for me to own it in most cases as a general consumer. But I, I believe that if we are in a virtual environment, and we can implement some sort of um, incentive for ownership, whether that means, you know, you know, in a gaming environment, for example, a lot of purchasing behavior is incentivized through in-app purchases, upgrades. It's a lot of transfer of virtual currency within the gaming community to upgrade the experience in the virtual world. And I think that's where we can kind of reshape the narrative on what ownership of music looks like, because we potentially in the virtual world can create upgrades or upgraded experience based upon ownership of certain assets within the virtual world. See, in, in the gaming world right now, because they're, they're already trained to believe that, okay, if I buy, you know, this gun or if I buy this, you know, tool or buy this thing within the virtual world, I'll have the ability to do more stuff and I'll, be, I'll have a better time when I'm playing or I'll be able to accomplish more. We don't have that same type of incentivized purchasing behavior within the music domain. So that's an opportunity for us to kind of consider like, okay, well, how do we incentivize ownership of a digital asset? Because in the game, the, the, the virtual gun is, you know, it, it's a virtual gun and it's, it can only really be used by the virtual, um, the, the, the virtual player or the, um, the avatar or, or the, the character that's being controlled by the human. But with music, of course, the human can enjoy it, but also there may be some opportunity to think about how can we make that more of a community thing that other people can enjoy. So I believe that this, these are things that the music community, the music producers and the music makers and creators have to be thinking about now because the challenge will be someone else is going to think about that that may not be within the music industry. You're going to have other people see similar opportunities that do not make music, that do not care about music or do not care about, you know, any of the, the legalities or furthermore, any of the, the, um, the, the ways that music is currently leveraged by music makers to create revenue. They're not going to necessarily care about that because at the end of the day, it'll be about supporting the virtual, the game or the virtual environment that supports the game. And I think that for us, it's important to have real ideas that continue to bring us value and don't allow us to be trapped in a, another situation where a platform makes the rules and we as music producers, music creators, have to just either get down or lay down essentially. That's, that's not the position you wanna be in. So that's why I challenge us to start thinking about it. Like what are some things that we can do in the virtual world? Because like I said, more people are spending their time watching things like Twitch. But then if you think about it, it's not just that they're watching Twitch, you're not just watching other people play, but they're also playing a game. You know, that's another thing that a lot of people are spending their time online doing. You know, we think that people are spending a lot of time on just social media. You know, you see it all the time. People spend all their time in the phones and all this stuff. And people are actually spending a lot of time on social media, but they also spend a lot of time in games. They also are spending a lot of time actually connecting with each other through these games. So, you know, we're already seeing much more major steps towards virtual interactions that are deeper than just a like, a follow, a subscribe, a, you know, um, a comment. 
in, in, you know, in a massive multiplayer online game, for example, you got a lot of people that are just, they're talking to each other, they're interacting with each other, but they're also potentially building with each other, or they're also competing with each other. You know, a lot of the games, you know, a lot of the games allow you to interact with people and, and create much deeper connections than just, I'm your friend on you know, Instagram or, you know, I, I, I can DM you. It's a lot deeper than that with the game. And I, I believe that that also creates another opportunity for musicians. Cause I, I believe that the, the, the virtual world will give us more opportunities to collaborate with each other. I think right now we're kind of very, we're, we're content with, Oh, I just put it on Dropbox and then my friend gets it and then they do their thing at their at the time that they want to do it and then they put it back on Dropbox and I take it and do that. That's one level. But, you know, in a game, especially when we're talking about online gaming, there's opportunity for real time, synchronized interaction. And that potentially could lead to things like virtual jam sessions. That can be virtual studio sessions. There's a lot of opportunities for us to be thinking about now, but again, we have to be ahead of this thought. We can't be at the, at the tail end receiving whatever somebody else says or dictates as um, the thing um, once they finally decide, okay, yeah, you say Rockstar, for example, a gaming company that makes GTA and um, Red Dead Redemption and all that. What say they decide? Okay, we're gonna make you know uh, a game that's focused on on music production, right? Say they do that. Well, you know, if they make it, they're not necessarily thinking about the benefit to the musicians. They're thinking more so about how they can sell their game. Um, so we got to think about that. We got to, we got to be the ones to have the influence on them. We got to have the ideas. And, you know, I, I think the, the, the current level of console gaming is one aspect to consider, but then a couple years from now, like, like I said, I, I was on the iPad, but I think the next thing after that is VR, like much deeper VR. I mean, you know, it's cool to be able to touch a screen, but what if I was fully immersed and I don't have to touch a screen anymore? Then we can start, you know, really digging into other types of things. And I'm not saying that you're just going to be touching virtual space. I, I believe that games, um, that's why I said there's very much overlap between gaming and music production. Gaming right now, you still use a controller, right? And in music production, you still use a controller, right? You still use a MIDI controller. You're still going to have to use some type of controller, but it may be it may be a little bit different in a VR context. And these are things that we should be thinking about. Like you know, that that may change our whole approach to making music, being in a virtual studio that is fully immersive and not just on a screen that I have to click on or a screen that I have to touch with my hand in this way. So th there's a lot of stuff that I, I foresee being a, um, a great opportunity for music producers and the, the music technology community as a whole. But again, we just have to have the conversations before it just gets thrown in our lap and they, they say, okay, well, you just gotta take this. Because that, does, that doesn't necessarily help us to have a level of control or ownership over how these things progress and how they shape us as musicians. You know, I, I saw, I, I looked at how people scrambled to adjust to the idea of a digital download versus a physical unit, a physical copy of a album or a song for that matter. And it's, that was a big adjustment. People couldn't really wrap their head around that because they, they thought it was, you know, already devaluing what they were doing. And, you know, it, it, they, there was a lot of resistance to that. So then a lot of musicians were slow to transition to digital downloads. And then when streaming became more of an uh, option, then you had a lot more people resistance, resistant to it because that was even 
less value up front. That was I that was less money that I could get up front. Instead of getting, you know, even a dollar twenty-nine, now I'm getting pennies on the dollar for a single stream. So there's a lot of resistance and you know there was not a lot of conversation or education for that matter around what what the streaming model presents as a new opportunity versus a you know a perpetual sale or a, a, a retail sale of a album or a, a CD or, a, or any type of physical item for that matter. So there was not a lot of conversation about that within the music community until it, it was kind of too late. And then you, you still have a lot of people that are resistant to streaming now, but I, I believe now more people are starting to understand and be more educated around streaming and there there eventually eventually will be a lot less resistance to that but that that's already being behind the curve because those that have invested in streaming and understanding what streaming brings in terms of value already have strategies and have you know um, have partnerships and all kind of things that are set up for them to win within streaming. And I think th that's why we need to think about these things before they hit us and not after and have to scramble to figure out how to operate within this new world. Because I, I can tell you guys, looking at how gaming and how the interactions are happening online with, with the gaming community, that is going to hit our community in the near future. It's not going to be 20 years from now. I don't even think it's going to be 10 years from now. I think you're going to see some major transitions within the next decade for sure. And it's going to be major and we're going to have to figure out how to adapt to that as well. I love us thinking about this, but we got to continue the conversation. It can't just be a one time thing and then we're done with it. We have to keep thinking about it because, you know, a lot of us right now are using social media in a way that almost mimics gaming. A lot of us are, are um, operating as music producers in a virtual environment, you know, through Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and we're battling and competing for likes and we're battling and competing for social clout. Um, but the gaming community is actually battling for stuff that's a little bit more uh, or, or I should say a little bit less subjective than that. You know, when you actually win a game, when you actually, you know, win a battle, it's, it's evident within a game. And I think that is a direction that I could see the music community potentially moving in where things are a bit less subjective and a bit more clear, clear cut. Because right now, the amount of followers you have may look like you're winning on the internet, but it's not very clear whether you are. It's all like a, a, a matter of perception at the moment. But when we start looking at how game, how games work, the winner is clear. If you win the game, it's very clear. If you lost the game, that round is very clear. So I think that will also help to redefine and shape how people perceive certain musicians once we move into an environment like that. Um, I think there will be a lot less um, fronting in some regards, but then you also got to consider if we're in some type of environment like that, potentially now um, it turns into a situation where whoever has the most money wins. It's not that much different than what it is now, honestly, because you know, the reason that the record labels win as far as pushing the new artists is concerned is because they have money. They have money for marketing. They have money for promotion. They have money for production. They have money to afford creating a high quality product and propagating it to a mass audience and making sure that it's there's enough contact points for the artist or the song to become sticky enough for them to really monetize and leverage the, the opportunity that the artist presents. They have enough money to do that. So it won't be that much different, but we just have to think about that now and kind of start considering what could you do strategically to approach that type of scenario and how you can still be positioned for success. Um, I know that all of this is hypothetical. Um, 
you have to understand when you're watching my channel, I'm very much, I'm very much a futurist. I'm, I'm very much thinking about what we could look like in the future. So just, you know, I understand like for some of you guys, this conversation may be abstract. It's not as tangible. It's, it's not a conversation for everybody. I get it. Um, but for those of you that have the mind to extrapolate with me and have the mind to consider these, these possibilities with me, I think that we can have some deeper conversations and figure out how to strategically set up for the next 15, 20 years from now. Because once we go fully virtual, I mean, it's going to be a divide. It's going to be those that say, I'm in the real world and I'm going to just do it the old way. And then there's going to be people that win in the, in the virtual domain. So just, just food for thought, but we, we gotta, we gotta stay ahead of stuff. We gotta, we can't be so limited by what's happening right now. And, you know, keep repeating the same narrative around, like, you gotta do this and you gotta do that. Cause like, that's fine. But I think that when people figure out how to strategically leverage a new platform or new technology first, they create a lot more opportunities for themselves than those that are late to that game. So, you know, that's why it's very important to have the conversation now. Um, I'm gonna go into the chat. I know I've, I've talked for some time now. And um, like I said, I know a lot of the stuff is abstract. So um, I appreciate y'all that are hanging in and having the conversation or, or have the mind to listen so that we can have this conversation. So let me see what y'all saying in this chat room here. Um, JP the villain said, ain't enough time today. I got, I barely get enough time for music and social, barely any sleep. No, I can dig it, man. You know, I'm not saying you gotta dedicate your whole life to figuring out all this stuff. I mean, you got time. And that's another thing, like don't, don't get so bent out of shape by, um, manufactured urgency. I'm not saying that it's imminent danger. It's not going to happen tomorrow. It's like, um, life, life is a continuum. You, you, you have time, you have the time that you have here, right? So if you feel like you're racing against the clock, you, you're not really, um, you know, if you, if, if today was your last day, no reason for you to be racing to figure out how to set yourself up 15 years from now. Right? So, I mean, it, it, you, it's take, take each day as it comes, but spend the time to, you know, prioritize things that help you, that help you expand and help you to grow. And that may be spending a little bit of time looking at tech, you know, even if that's five, 10 minutes in a day, like, Hey, what's going on? What's happening? Not just like, I only look at music production stuff and I only look at, you know, um, I only follow music producer people. It's like, now you got to follow a lot of stuff because you know, the thing is a lot of the, the music technology we have is created outside of the, the music domain. And then we, as music, um, you know, as music tech people start to adapt certain technologies and repurpose it for music. Um, you know, I heard within, within the industry that, uh, music technology is usually uh, a follower and not a leader. I I've heard that said by some very prominent people within the um, tech space. Um, I don't fully agree with it. I believe that that's a choice. I believe that certain, um, certain companies and certain um, players in the space don't have the um, resources or the economic freedom or security for that matter to try new things and therefore they will have to follow and wait until things are stable. But I don't believe in totality that the music technology domain are followers. I, I believe that there's always innovation happening. There's always, you know, boutique, niche, small companies that are looking at ways to push things forward and think outside of the box. So, you know, we can't be so focused on what we can do now and just repeating the same stuff over because that's what works now and not have any foresight into what other technologies um, 
are, are, are pending or are impending for that matter and what could be actually of use to us. Um, he said, let's see. Mike Checkmate, I see you, what's up, bro? Um, he says he's been noticing as a middle school teacher that absent students communicate with kids at, at the school faster on games like Roblox than even on social media like Snapchat. Yeah, there. I mean, folk, see the behavior is changing a lot. So, you know, I, I think a lot of older people at this point, because you know, even when you start talking about millennials, you're talking about 30 year olds. You're not talking about kids here when you say millennials. I, I, I hear that conversation a lot. Millennials this, millennials that, millennials think like this. And you know, at the end of the day, we're talking about grown adults, you know, Technically, I'm a millennial, technically, you know what I'm saying? So you're talking about adults here. Um, kids are not using technology the exact same way that we are. And I think it's very important to look at how are kids interacting? What are they doing? What are they finding valuable? Um, you know, I, I am thankful that I lived through the time where there was no internet and there was no mobile phones and there was none of that stuff that we rely on every day now and um i enjoyed being able to disconnect and not have 24 7 connectivity to certain things but i also appreciate that the world has gotten a lot smaller with all this technology that we do have and you know now it's just trying to balance it's, it's about prioritizing stuff understanding that you know life does not have to revolve around this technology but at the end of the day this technology allows us to do interesting things that could be useful if we leverage it the correct way and use it for good and not for evil so i, I believe that as long as we continue to look at good ways to leverage it it'll be good but you know you can start by looking at what are kids doing how are they behaving online what are they doing because you know, just because you don't use something doesn't mean that it's not relevant. Let, let's be real, you know. Um, I try to talk to, like, younger folks all the time, like, okay, what are you listening to? Like, who's your favorite artist? You know, what You know, what social media are you using? Are you using Snapchat? Did you mess with IG? You know, uh, a lot of them don't even mess with social media like that. They, they look at it, but they don't necessarily feel compelled to post. They don't feel compelled to communicate that way. So, you know, Things are changing. They're going to continue to change. So, you know, don't be so stuck in your ways that you only think that what the way you're doing it now is going to be the way it's going to be 20 years from now, because that's not true. Um, let's see here. T. James Dean says, if we're all barely making money as it is, why is collapse the answer? So we have to split what little we have. I'm not sure this pans out. What I feel we need is to financially take hold of destiny. Um, T. James Dean, I get where you're coming from. Most of the, the most influential music ever created was done through collaboration. Not, not made by a single person, but made by collaborating with a multitude of excellent artists, excellent musicians, excellent producers, engineers. Do not go into this domain of music thinking that you can do everything on your own because in order to be a good producer, you have to be good at respecting musicianship, respecting when people are better fit to do certain tasks, respecting how things could be best created through collaborating and connecting with subject matter experts that can help you to realize your product as a music producer. You have to think that way. You can't be so tight with everything that you want to control 100% and then, you know, you control 100% of zero and 100% of zero is not a good share to have. You'd rather have 25% of billions than 100% of zero. So don't think with a scarcity mindset when it relates to music. You have to think about it in terms of it being abundant because 
creativity is abundant. Creativity is not scarce. Um, so you should not think, oh, I have to take it all and I'll, I'll never have an opportunity again. Like you'll have plenty of opportunities. I think that's one of the challenges for a lot of us is understanding that it, we're not, we're not so much in a competition that we got to be, um, you know, closing everybody out, trying to, you know, take the little bit of crumbs out there that exists. Cause I'm here to tell you that it's not crumbs out here. There's plenty of money out here to be made in the industry. It's just about understanding how the industry really works, where the money flows, where the money comes from, and then understanding how to best position yourself to be a part of that money transfer and not so much thinking like, I just have to do everything myself and I have to figure it out so I can take 100% of everything that comes to me. Collaboration is necessary. I don't care what type of product you're making. You're gonna have to hire people. You're gonna have to figure out the right resources to connect with and get stuff done. And a lot of times as music producers, I see us complaining about artists don't want to make sell or they don't want to buy beats and they don't want to pay us and all this other stuff. And I think uh, oftentimes we're barking up the wrong tree because if you really think about um, how the music industry has worked historically, artists really didn't pay for beats anyhow. Um, most artists didn't have money until a record label came and provided an advance and provided funds that allowed the artists to create opportunities to hire other people like studios and producers and engineers and, you know, get everybody paid in order to create the product. Um, so when we start barking like at these artists, like, oh, you, you, they don't want to pay us and they're all flossing and all this stuff. Well, I mean, let's be real. Artists have to floss, to be honest. I mean, to some degree, I mean, we don't, you don't look up to people that have less than you, right? I mean, I'm not saying that as a musician, you gotta be a, um, you gotta be a fake person that only is um, concerned with people's perception of you. But I think in order to be a hero, you have to be above average. You have to be, you have to do things that are above, above average. You have to be aspirational to be a hero. And part of how a lot of artists relate to that and try to achieve that is through the things that they have and the, the things that they show off. And, you know, that's because like you, you just already, you've already shown that money is important through your conversation in this. And I, I don't want to single you out T James thing, but I know a lot of producers believe that money is an important aspect of how they're going to grow and manifest their destiny. So you got to understand that people, when they see someone doing it big, when they see someone balling out and, you know, you know, making it rain and all that stuff, that's aspirational because that's, that, that's someone that looks kind of like them or is relatable to them, but is on a whole nother level, you know, doing it bigger than them. That's aspiration. And that makes them want to, you know, um, aspire to, to be like that person and follow that person. So, Yes, artists are spending money on perception, but that's because they're artists and they're in the public and people have to look up to them and have to follow them. Otherwise, there's no, it's, it's hard to sell a record if people don't follow you and look up to you. So that being said, we're barking up the wrong tree a lot of the times because we're not understanding that the money is not necessarily coming from the artist. Not like the artist started off rich. A lot of times the artist was poor and then somebody invested money, like a record label invested money into the artist. Then the artist now has perceived a, a, a lot of money because they have a large advance or a large investment from a record label that is looking to recoup that money off of the sales and other things that the artist does once they put a record out or put a product out. Um, but oftentimes we're looking at the artist like, man, they don't want to pay us. It's like, well, that's, you know, if they can get the product done for, for nothing, you know, that's that's normal. People are trying, uh, oftentimes, trying to get their products done or completed for as cheaply or as as cost effective as possible. Think about how many producers crack, you know, crack DAWs and crack software and all this stuff. Right? People are always looking for 
you know, the, the maximum benefit with the, the lowest amount of responsibility, you know, so people don't necessarily want to have to spend on all these things. But what I'm telling you is we, we have to break that mindset on our side. We, part of the problem is that if nobody wants to pay anyone, then you're stopping money from circulating, circulating. You're stopping money from actually being available to others. Um, collaboration is necessary to get a good product done. So don't, don't have this mindset that you can just do everything by yourself and have the highest quality product possible with just your own efforts. I don't care how good you are, you're going to have to have someone else there to help you to realize certain aspects because it's just, it's not, it's not productive to just think that you can do it all yourself. You end up spending too much time on things that you shouldn't spend time on and you end up losing out on opportunities by the time that you've wasted on trying to, you know, take full ownership and be the sole owner of a certain product. Um, okay. I know I went uh, uh, in length on that, but I, I just, I think that it's important for us not to um, discount the value of collaboration. It's super important. Uh, let's see here. Kapow says, on a side note regarding tech, how long do you think until we can buy something like Nexus on a tablet, 16 channel module, rather than say a role in Integra? Well, I mean, Sample Tank, some of y'all don't like Sample Tank. I know that. I get that. But Sample Tank already exists. Also, um, Core Gadget to me is, is a bit closer to something like Nexus in terms of the, um, the depth of the content, the sounds, and the sound possibilities. Um, Gadget is already in there. That's why I use Gadget because it's kind of like that concept of more of a sound module, but it's not just a 16 channel. It's you know, as many channels as your iPad can support. Um, you already got options like that in there and it's gonna continue to grow, okay? Um, Nexus may not be, or, you know, Nexus may not be the one that, that is in the I, iPad, but there's other options and there will continue to be other options. Um, I'm sorry, I, I missed out what you were saying, JP. You said um, you couldn't take yourself serious if you was on a game all day not against the clock, it's the competition. Okay. Interestingly enough, I know a lot of us, it, that, that's why we gotta have this conversation because I know a lot of us kind of feel like we're better than gamers. And I wanna provide a different perspective on that because we think that we're better than gamers only because of a perception. And the reality is that Gamers spend a lot of time in front of, you know, a computer or a television working or operating a controller within a virtual environment. A ton of producers do the same thing all the time. That's the main thing that they're doing a lot of the time is spending time in front of either a TV or a computer controlling some sort of controller within a virtual environment trying to accomplish a task. We're not that much better than gamers. We shouldn't look at ourselves as better than gamers just because we make music, because like I told you in early in the stream, a lot of people are spending more time on Twitch than they are at Pandora or at Spotify or at SoundCloud. So people are very much interested in the story that the gamer is creating. They're, they're very much interested in watching the level of competition that the, ga the gamer is engaging in. See, the thing is, what is inherently different about the gamer right now than the producer is that there's, there's more action for the gamer because they're competing directly with people right away. Whereas for producers, we can choose to compete or we can choose not to compete. And, you know, the time that we're spending in front of the computer, not necessarily that interesting for a lot of people to watch. Whereas with the gamer, it's a story unfo unfolding and it's action and it's much more engaged. 
Um, that's why things like eSports exist. That's why um, things like E3 exist. You know, E3, um, I, I saw that, you know, they, they sold like tens of millions of dollars in tickets uh, for E3. And E3 basically is an event where they do um, eSports. And they did it in LA, but it's, it's basically, you know, a, a, I think a weekend event and they do a whole bunch of eSports, you know, comp competitive video gaming in an arena or in some type of um, venue and people go pay to watch that. And we're talking about millions of dollars were paid to go watch E3. I don't know about y'all, but I haven't seen anywhere where millions of dollars are being paid for folks to go watch us make beats right now. And these gamers are getting paid. Like these, the top gamers are getting paid out there. So I don't think we, we have a lot of basis to look at ourselves as being better than gamers. I think we just have to look at it as like, it's a different discipline because in order to be excellent at a game, it's, it's a discipline. It's not just, it's not luck. It takes a lot of practice and dedication to be excellent at a game. You can just play a game and get whatever results, but if you're, wanna, if you're gonna compete with the best, it takes a lot of practice and time spent. Um, today, gamers get paid, and I, I wanna reemphasize that. Today, gamers get paid. Like, the top gamers get paid. You know, there are platforms, like I said, I mentioned Twitch, Twitch is one platform that play that pays content creators. People are subscribing to other gamers for a fee. For a fee. And there's there's different pricing tiers that you can subscribe to watch your favorite gamer gamer your favorite gamer play. I don't know why I'm I'm fumbling today, but you can watch your favorite gamer play on Twitch subscription and the content creator or the gamer gets paid a percentage of the revenue from the subscription. Gamers are getting paid today. So I think that we have to change our perception around what gamers are really doing and what even motivates them. They're not just playing a game. A lot of these people are competing or are, are wanting to be in the space so that they can compete and actually earn revenue as well. It's not, not necessarily just for the love of the game today. So I, I would just say, be careful with thinking that we are better and instead we should maybe have a perception that we're spending our time on something that we love as a craft that takes a lot of dedication and skill to produce well. And potentially if we are good at what we do and we leverage the opportunities that exist, then we can create revenue opportunities and create ways to monetize our skill set within the space. And that's the same thing that gamers can do today. So we got to think about it that way and not so, you know, like I would just feel bad because, you know, I, that's a lot of time playing a game and you don't get anywhere. No, gamers actually accomplish things too. You know, even if it is, I finished a game, you know, that may not mean anything to you, but finishing a beat doesn't necessarily mean anything either. Because what is a finished beat if you don't do anything with it? It still may be valuable to you, but it may only be valuable to you because you finished it, but it didn't create any value necessarily until you did something competitive with it, like put it into the market and actually try to get it out there and promote it and see if it actually resonates with the audience and people want to buy it or stream it. You see what I'm saying? So we got to think differently about what we're doing and not be like, yeah, they're just, you know, wasting time because they're not. All right. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, pe people um, perceive maybe because some of I know some of the folks in this um, chat in this live stream are older. So, you know, uh, some of us grew up in an era where gaming did not get you paid and it was just like a nerd thing to do. And, you know, if you if you wasted your time doing that, you were just wasting your time and you know, there was no real benefit besides winning the game. That's not today, guys. If you haven't been paying attention, um, people are paying millions of dollars to watch gamers compete. So rethink 
the way that you perceive gamers. Um, because I believe that there's a lot that we can learn from them and the community, and there's a lot of things that we can implement into how we're creating opportunities for ourselves as a community and figure out ways that we can re-engage with the audience because let's be very clear, it is not that entertaining for a lot of people to watch us click around in our favorite DAW to make music. They're not gonna spend hours watching us do that. So we might have to rethink some of that. Some people are engaged, like I think us as a community, producers, we like that, but your, the average musician or music fan for that matter, ain't, they don't necessarily want to watch you click around for hours. And you know, literally if, if, it, if you're making five minute tracks, that's fine too, but there's limits to that because they want to see what happens with the music after. They don't necessarily just want to see you click around and win because making the beat is not winning the game. You know what I'm saying? Um, let's see here. Display name says it's hard to be objective when it comes to beat making. So it's hard for there to be a simple competition like gamers have. Um, I agree with that. It, it, music is very subjective. Um, but there are ways to gamify musicianship. That's already been proven. You already saw things like Guitar Hero which gamifies a certain level of musicianship or a certain level of command over a type of instrument. It's not like a, a, a legitimate guitar or, you know, that, that sort of thing. But I think there are ways to gamify certain aspects of what we do. Um, I, I think even, you know, we, we watch things like Against the Clock and, um, you know, that, that sort of, um, competitive uh, challenge behavior with production now. So I, I think there's ways to extrapolate on that and create more of a competition that is less subjective if we are given the same set of tools or the same set of constraints to work in, right? I think that that's one way to make things less subjective. Because right now we're based, we're, you know, Nobody sees what we use at the, for the most part unless we put it on display. You know, you, you guys have seen stuff that I use because I'm on YouTube. However, I could easily shut all of this off and then you wouldn't know what I made anything on if I just post something, you know, post some music on the YouTube and it didn't say what I, I use, you wouldn't know. Um, so I would just have to compete based upon subjectively how much do you like that music at that point. But the moment we put in some constraints that everyone can um, objectively see, then that creates an opportunity for us to compete in a more objective way. Yeah, like um, JP said, rhythm roulette. I, I, sorry, I, I didn't. Um, I, I didn't have all the names. That there's there's a few. There's rhythm roulette. There's against the clock. There's um, I forgot the the other one that um, what Machine Masters does or whatever. All, all of those different things. Those, those become a bit more objective because you know it like a, a set um, parameters around what could be done or how uh, what could be used to create. And I think that helps to facilitate a, a way to compete if that is something that we want to do. I'm not saying that that's the only thing we want to do because that's not the only thing people are doing with games right now. People are also collaborating. There's, there's a such thing as co-op mode. And in co-op mode, you're working together to solve problems. And you may not be fighting against um, other people. You may be fighting against, you know, um, virtual, um, people and virtual enemies and things of that nature. And sorry, I, I don't have all the terminology for the gaming. I, I, I know there's a proper term for the, um, the virtual or digital um, enemies or opposition. I don't, I don't have it off the top of my head. Some of y'all may know it. So if y'all say it, then please correct me because I don't know all of that stuff. But I know that, that um, you're, there is a co-op and there, there is certain games offer co-op and allow you to work together. So we don't necessarily have to look at it just in terms of competitive nature. But I think ultimately the competition does become about, you know, who's the best musician, who's the best producer, who's, who's got the, um, the most, 
um, resonating songs. You know, those things become how we compete. So, you know, those things could be gamified. And I think, like I said, they already gamified to a degree. We already battle with how many streams did you get? How many downloads did you get? How many likes did you get? You know, all that stuff, that's gamification already. So there's levels to that, you know, of course, some of that stuff can be bought, but at the same time, those are some of the, the main things that we're using to compete with each other right now. All right. Um, let's see. Peter, I think. Peter. Um, I'm an ex-pro gamer, hobby producer, and I could tell you from experience, it took me a lot faster to make 10K off gaming than it took me to make anything close to that off music. But then again, I played popular games from the moment they came out. I never had a music outlet of that equivalent. And so you said something really interesting. You played popular games. See, a lot of us music producers say we want to compete, but don't want to do popular music. Right. I mean, that's that's reality. Right. A lot of us say we want to compete, but don't want to do popular music. So I think you said a lot just with that alone. You say you made 10,000 real quick by playing popular games, because if you were playing the games and nobody was playing like the old games or the games that people were not competing with, you probably wouldn't have the audience. You probably wouldn't be able to make that much money. When you play the popular games, you got bigger audience, more people are interested, more people are competing. There's more opportunity for you to potentially make money, but you just have to be better at it. Um, so there, there's a lot of <laughs> overlapping concepts here. That's why I say we can learn from this if we understand what's happening. I'm, and please, I, I don't want none of y'all to sit up here and say, J Myrex was telling me to go make commercial pop music and that's the only way to make money. You can make money off of a, a niche music and a, a niche sound. You just got to be willing to promote it and you got to find who your audience is. But what I'm saying is your man in here already just said playing popular games allowed him to be a bit more competitive and earn money quicker than playing niche games that nobody was really looking at. So things to consider nonetheless. Not saying that that should shape you as an artist. I think as an artist, you still have the ability to influence. Whereas with gaming, you don't necessarily have the ability to influence in certain ways that an artist or musician can. So I think that's the beauty of being an artist is that the influence is there, the inspiration is there. But pay attention to, you know, when we start talking about money, money has to do with where the money is flowing. You can't, you can't chase money where there is no money at the end of the day. I don't want you guys to be out here chasing money uh, if you don't have to anyhow, you know. I don't believe in chasing money, but I do believe that if we're gonna have a, a, a financial conversation, we need to be realistic about how the money is generated and where the money exists within the, um, the business. And understanding that alone will help you to make decisions that better position you to be in front of the money transfer. Um, yes, sir. Let's see. Um, pins up says, I so wish there was a beat battle in my area. Sometimes you got to fly out, man. Um, sometimes you got to get out of your, out of your area. When I, when I went to one stop shop 10 years ago, they didn't have it in LA. I had to go to a different state where they were holding it. And at that one stop shop, I met a lot of great producers, connected with um, some great A&Rs, record labels, and companies for that matter. And that's actually going, flying out to that one stop shop is how I got connected with Native Instruments and how, and that's what landed me a role as a sound designer at Native Instruments that same year because I took that opportunity to fly out and connect. You can't just stay in one place and expect opportunities to come to you. You gotta be willing to get out of your, your comfort zone. You gotta be willing to get out of what, what's familiar to you and go out and connect with people and, and meet people. And if that means going to a different state where there's opportunity, you gotta make that, you gotta make that happen. If that means saving some money, you gotta prioritize that. You can't just think that it's just gonna come to you and that's gonna create the opportunity that's gonna change your life. That's not how it works. 
Um, let's see here. Let's see here. Display name says, but watching us create kind of ruins the magic for a lot of people that are not producers. I, I, um, I, I kind of agree with that and uh, I've battled with that, but we also do know that, um, some people get inspired by it and some people through the exposure find, um, the, the inspiration to want to pursue music. So that, that's what always reconciled sharing this type of stuff for me. Cause you know, honestly, I don't have to share anything that I'm doing online. I, I just don't, I can just stick to just, I put my music out. I work with these artists. I work with these, you know, companies. I put the stuff out and I just do me and nobody knows what I use, what I do, how I do it. But I know that it inspires people as well. There are certain people, there's a small sector of the world that is going to be inspired. And my thought was if I can inspire the next Dr. Dre just through maybe a little bit of what I'm showing or, you know, spark somebody that could even influence the next Dr. Dre. That kind of thing always resonated with me. So I'd rather just be like, okay, I'm gonna show some of the stuff as I can and I'm gonna have these conversations and hopefully someone gets inspired and does something more and does something greater with it. But I, I definitely understand what you mean by taking away the magic. I think that there's always gonna be more magic, but we gotta be more creative because I think a lot of the magic that we perceived that was once there has actually um, become less magical because it's a lot easier now. So it's not as magical as it used to be, say, 30 years ago when you used to have to have all this stuff and used to have to be a mad scientist to connect it all together and do all this stuff. And you have to be a genius on the, you know, instruments and all that. It's not like that anymore. So I think we have to continue to be creative as well and not look at the magic as just being how the music is created. But I think that's why we have these conversations about what's the next stages? You know, what are some other ways we can engage with technology and not just, hey, here's a digital file, go download it. Because it's more to it than that. And the internet and the, the current technology and future technology will allow us to do a lot more than just Here's a, a virtual download, or here's a downloadable file. Go listen to that. Um, let's see. Pins Up says, no, I find it inspiring, like when Ryan Leslie made those beat videos early on. I understand that. That's why I. That's one of the reasons why I do this because I know people get inspired by it. Um, no TV, no movies, no games, just music. That's how I've been all year all year it take a toll but um i don't i don't know what you oh you say you're proud of where my money and time being spent trust me don't 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 get it twisted i'm not telling you don't spend time on your craft I, I believe that producers should spend a lot of time on their craft and if you want to be excellent at what you're doing you, you should continue to like push forward and try to figure out how to be better at what you do um, so this is not a conversation about you trying to do something else or become a better gamer. I'm just saying that there's a lot of things that are in play right now that will influence how we proceed forward within this space. And it's important for us to understand, like I said, take a little bit of time to educate yourself. If you got five minutes and you got a phone and you can read a, a tech news feed and see what's happening, just know what's happening so you, and then have some thoughts about it because that it might inspire you to think differently about how you're positioning yourself instead of just like, oh, I'm just going to do it this way because such and such won that way. It's like, well, now people that's going to win are ahead of the game and they're doing stuff and they're not really talking about how they did it because they're, they're winning with that strategy. So it's not the time to talk about how they did it yet. So I'm just saying put some thought into like what's happening around you as well and make sure you stay educated. Um, e. Jr. says this presentation is very valid, but I'm not convinced that the process of making music has not seen its peak and there's still a lot of professional opportunities, but urban producers need to unite. Um, you said uh, you're not convinced that the process of making music has not seen its peak. I'm not saying that the process of music has, or making music has seen its peak. 
I'm just saying that there are more opportunities on the horizon and we should think about what's coming and figure out how to get ahead of it and have the conversation of, around how we could benefit from it before instead of having to scramble and figure out how to benefit once the, the rules are set. Um, Peter, I want to say Peter, I'm going to say Peter. Uh, gotta love what you do, period. I love gaming, every aspect of it. For me, Beast was just a visualized romance, but I lack the passion. You gotta do something every day out of love, not because you feel forced. Totally agree, you know. Um, that's why I said you shouldn't be necessarily chasing money. You know, you should definitely love, if you're doing music production, you should love it. You shouldn't be chasing money. Um, I think that chasing money creates a lot of opportunity for you to do things that you don't love, that you're not passionate about, and ultimately um, it, it will take away from the art if it's all about money. Um, I, I don't think that music, I think a lot of producers um, benefit from having jobs and some stability because um, you can make decisions differently. You don't have to whore your talent out. You can, you can decide, I don't want to do that. I don't want to work on that. I want to work on this. That's when you're not starving for money. But I think what happens is a lot of, there are a lot of music producers out here that are starving for money and they will do anything for money and it makes them desperate and they'll, they'll compromise any sense of um, artistic integrity just so that they can have an opportunity of making money. And, you know, even if they do it at the expense of, um, you know, not owning a catalog or not having ownership of, of their, their content or, you know, all sorts of things that create long-term issues because they, they need short-term money. So um, I don't think you should chase money. I think you should be passionate about what you do. You should love what you do. Um, but like I said, if we're going to have a conversation about where money is generated, then we have to be realistic about it. We can't be... Um, we can't be romantic about it and say, oh, it, you know, it's just going to come, you know, it's just, no, it ain't going to just come. You, you, better, you better know how the actual business takes place in the industry if you want to have access to money. And understanding that uh, will take you a long way. So like your man said in here, understanding that playing a popular game it's gonna have more eyes than playing a not popular game. That's just, that's being realistic. That's being honest about where the money is. Um, let's see here. I got some good stuff going on here. I, I love the conversation y'all having in here right now in this chat room. Um, what time is it? It's about that time, guys. I've been on here for a minute and, you know, the longer I make it, the, the harder it is for people to watch it on the replay. So to be continued, I'm, I'm coming back. You know, I'm not, I'm not gone. I'm, I'm here. Um, this conversation will be to continue. Um, I want to start doing a lot more of this stuff. We got, we got to just figure out a better way to do it. Um, I hope that this conversation was enlightening or inspirational or at least spark some thoughts and some, some different ways of thinking for people. Um, I know everyone's not going to agree with my perspective. It's just my perspective. That's why we're having a conversation. Um, you can come back and tell me, you're wrong. Um, pass some respect if you want to talk to me about it because um, it's just an opinion, you know. Pass some respect if you want to have uh, a conversation with me about it because I'm not going to engage with a, anyone that wants to um, try to demean my opinion or thoughts about something, but I, I'm open to have the conversation and um, listen to other people's opinion or extrapolations because I'm just extrapolating. And remember that, guys. I'm projecting and extrapolating to what I perceive to be a potential future. It's not necessarily true. It's not necessarily false either. It's just projection. It's just, it is just thinking about the future. And I think it's important that we think about the future. And that's why I like to have these conversations about the future, because it's, it's important for us to not just be so um, wrapped up in what's happening now that we can't make plans and think about 
what potentially could happen because that's where the most opportunity is is like in the future what's what's unknown that's where the most opportunity is so um we'll continue this conversation i appreciate y'all for all of y'all that haven't already done so make sure you check out my website www.altruist.com i have a free six-part video course entitled sound mind sessions it is a major benefit for music producers for uh, recording engineers, sound designers, recording artists, anyone that's really looking about looking into leveraging and positioning themselves in the music industry, check that out. It's a great primer. Even if you've been doing it for a long time, you'll find some value. I promise you, you're, you're not going to regret it and it's free. Go check it out. I'll leave a link in the video description. Also, if you're a, a musician, an artist, producer looking for music production, um, please hit me up on my website, altruist.com. Um, I, I am definitely taking collaborations. Um, you can you can click on the link. There's a link in the um, description that will lead you to where you can get information about music production services and get a quote for working. So if you want to get some work, you want to get some production done, come holler at me. All right. Until next time, I want to tell y'all. First of all, I appreciate y'all. Every last one of y'all. I want to tell y'all peace. God bless. And this will be to continue. All right. Holler at y'all later.